All right, welcome everybody to our Cassiopeia seminar here on March the 25th, 2024. We have Juan Sebastian Sanchez Casillo, who was a master's student here at the University of Waterloo. And Juan is going to talk about understanding the scale problem in the characterization of habitats for species conservation and protected areas research. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to mute myself and to let uh, Juan take over. So he will guide you home. Juan, just for posterity, is on the recording. When we get to be about 10 minutes away from the end, I will give you a signal probably in the chat, okay? Okay, perfect. All right, take it away. All right, well, thank you everybody. Uh, today, I will I would like to explain uh, a very inter interesting topic uh, that affect all areas in ecology, that is the scale problem. So along this presentation, uh, I have three objectives. I will try to explore our understanding of, of the scale problem and its relevance for habitat characterization. And from there, I will examine what is the scientific consensus about this issue and how can we deal with it. And at the end of this presentation, I will mention uh, some theoretical and methodological frameworks that we use to deal with this problem. Uh, well, so to start this presentation, I would like to set some fundamental assumptions that we have around uh, ecological processes and ecology in general. So I, I will do this through an example. So imagine that you are, uh, that given the importance of biodiversity to uh, hold an environmental threshold around the world that uh, allow uh, conditions for, of the environment that are beneficial for us to continue, uh, you, you, are, you, are, you, have been, you have been assigned uh, the conservation of an endangered species. As a land manager or, or, as, a, or, or as a researcher, you are interested on uh, preserving one species, uh, given the importance of, of, of biodiversity to sustain uh, all the environmental conditions that humans use to survive. So when we, when we think about uh, designing strategies to preserve a species, one of the first uh, questions that we approach to is, what is the habitat that these species need to survive? Uh, and a habitat, we can, we can describe it as, as the accessible beneficial conditions that allow individuals of a species to persist. And usually like uh, when we try to connect those environmental conditions with uh, the, the, recorders, the, the records of the species, uh, what, what does, it, does it occur or what is its abundance? We usually use mathematical formulas to connect uh, predictor variables that could be the amount of forests or the amount of uh, relevant resources with uh, a, a variable that we think represent uh, uh, the, the occurrence of the species uh, in, in, in an area of interest. We can think about the occurrence or the, or, or the abundance, for example. So when we're building these models, uh, we are very aware that uh, species are part of ecological systems and ecological systems are complex systems that have multiple variables interacting, interacting, and, uh, interacting and originating multiple emerging, emerging properties. So when we think about what can be affecting a species survival, we know there are multiple variables that might be influencing these species. But also we know that these variables vary across space and time. So by observing multiple uh, species and how they interact with their environment, we have come to notice that uh, different processes uh, can be identified according to how much time they take to occur and in what areas do they occur. So we we have we have uh, described the, the different uh, interactions of the species with the environment in a hierarchical way. We we can think about, for example, uh, if we see in this graph, uh, we can differentiate very well that there are processes that are that occur and very a very, in very short times and very uh, small areas that we can call like local processes. Like for example, when a species is selecting a, 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 a food resource uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, a small area, could be like in a tree, for example. Um, we can think also in processes that occur in, in, very, in huge uh, uh, areas and periods of time. Like for example, process of climate change that is, that is, that is occurring in a, in a global, in a global uh, extent and it takes time uh, to occur. So based on, on, on these kind of uh, differences of, of processes, we, we have to make a choice. We have to decide 
which process are, are we dealing with and how we can delimit that process in a way that we can uh, focus our attention on only one process. So that's where the scale concept enters to play. So the scale concept uh, refers to the spatial and temporal context where a, where, a phenomenon like, where a phenomenon like an ecological process occurs. So for us as, research, as researchers and could be also land managers, when we see the environment, we, we use the concept of a scale as, as a camera. We can kind of define different angles and uh, views of what uh, attributes or, or ecological processes we, we want to look at. So for example, you can see like, uh, we can define uh, according to the complexity of the, of the system that we're looking at, uh, could be, we, we can have views of only one organism, a population, a community. So what kind of, uh, what attributes has the scale that help us to define like these different uh, processes occurring ac across space and time? So we can define the scale uh, using two different attributes. We have the grain, that refers to the smallest environmental cue that a species might uh, perceive and that could influence an, an ecological process. And we also have the extent that is like the overall range of environmental cues that a species perceive to make a decision uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular space and time. So in like in more simple terms, we can think about the grain as the resolution. Like if we have our camera, that is the information that we can uh, we can uh, recollect from the environment. Uh, the grain uh, corresponds to the resolution, like how much detail are we able to capture of the environmental variable we are we are uh, re we are interested on in evaluating its relationship with the species, and the extent uh, will correspond to all the, all, all the the frame of our photo, like all the story area where we can take multiple samples of uh, different. Uh, uh, occurrence of, of the species, and uh, we, we could be able from there uh, make uh, some inf inference about the interaction of the species. So the the basic unit that defines uh, for for the for the species perspective, what is the grain and the stand of of which which in the species interact with environmental uh, variables is the movement and behavior. So we know that a species to interact with their environment, they move in a certain time frame and, and do, along certain distances. So that will be like our uh, our ba basic uh, determinant for a scale from a species perspective. That's what define uh, the grain and the extent that they can perceive. And then when we think about like more complex processes, we know that from a single species, uh, the movement and behavior of multiple individuals add up into more complex processes when we think about populations or when we think about multiple species, these processes, can, they meet together and generate like more complex scales that, that, that not only depend on the movement and behavior of only one species, but of multiple species as well. Well, so before continuing, uh, there is, I would like to, to mention that the scale concept uh, has been very, very ambiguously used uh, in research. Uh, because the world scale frequently is frequently associated with two kinds of scales that we use in ecology. So one of them is the conceptual scale, which uh, is also it has also been called the domains of level of, of organization. Those scales correspond to uh, concepts that have helped us to organize uh, the, the different processes and complexities of species interactions with their habitats. So that when we think about population, communities, or ecosystems, those are concepts that have an implicit uh, scale, but that we are not able to define in, 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 in measurements of a space of time. It's just like a concept that helps us to identify levels of complexity with, within ecological processes. And also, there are all, uh, quantitative scales that are those scales that we can actually measure and that we use to measure environmental variables. So we can inc these include geographical scales that are measured in distances and temporal scales that we measure in different time frames. So when we try to characterize an ecological scale relevant for a species, we are talking about uh, a combination between these two scales. It's, when we are interested in one ecological process, 
we define a domain or a conceptual skills where we think the species is uh, at interacting with their environment. And we try to use quantitative skills to do the limit physically and temporally where are the, those, those interactions occurring. So you, you will see the term scale used um, uh, interchangeably uh, in between the two terms, but uh, they all uh, kind of represent uh, those limits that we are trying to infer uh, about the species interaction with the environment. So well, why it is important uh, to take in account the scale concept for habitat characterization? Well, uh, the heterogeneity of environmental and ecological factors can vary with the scale. What does this mean? This means like uh, when you measure uh, an, an environmental factor, like for example, the amount of forest or the amount of certain research, if according to how, to how is the area that where you take uh, the, that sample of the environmental uh, factor that you're studying, you might not cap, you might not capture, or you, you might capture certain part of the variation that the species perceive. So, if you if you don't use a proper scale to measure that environmental factor, that will affect your capacity to detect the species interaction with that factor relevant for the for the species habitat. So this this led us to assume that there is a potential scale of effect, like there is there is it is likely that a species interact with their environment on a precise scale. And that scale is where the species perceive most of the environmental cues that it needs to make a decision. So we can define the scale of effect as the, sp as the spatial extents around a location in which uh, more variability of the response data that we have, like occurrence or abundance, it's explained. So. Usually there is a strong focus in the spatial side of the scale problem. Like we know that the environmental, environmental resources can vary across, across space and time, but uh, there, is, there has been a, an increase in information uh, in terms of spatial information of environmental predictors thanks to GIS data. So research has have a, a strong bias toward this kind of information, um, but, uh, uh, this doesn't mean that they ignore the temporal side of the scale question, but usually scales are associated with temporal frames. So for instance, you know, like if you know that if you have information about how the species move, you can uh, for, for certain know that if you are evaluating uh, areas very large according compared to the, the, to the maximum distance that a species can, can move, you can set you can set different scales. All right. So well, so why is important the scale of effect? The scale of effect will be will is an important piece of information on the on the relationship of a species with their their habitat because it will help us to delimit spatial areas uh, across across the across the environment that we that are relevant for that species and that we may have to take action to preserve or 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 conserve. So the scale, this the scale concept is really important for habitat characterization because it could offer a more precise delimitation of, of the areas that are relevant for species responses, uh, for positive species responses with their with in within their habitats. Well, but now how can we characterize a scale? So this is this is more um related to uh, to the data that, that we are that we use so in this case i will i will i will i will do my all the examples that i have in my presentation are are, are focused on gis data and usually in this kind of data we have a, like a like a, a, a like a grid like a, a, a square grid with where each square have a different a piece of information and from there we can we can uh, aggregate the data to to, to examine like different uh, patterns of environment of environmental factors. So when we think about uh, how we can characterize the scale using this kind of data, there is three three attributes that we have to consider. The first is the grain that is pretty similar to the to the grain that I mentioned before uh, at the species level from the species perspective. But for us, the grain is the smallest distinct distinguishable analytical unit that we have. So for instance, if we have a map. 
uh, the grain will be the the, the the size of the pit cell. Like will be that 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 small unit that the smallest unit that allows us to differentiate uh, two different resources in a map. Also, we have the, fo uh, the focus, that is the area which the grains of data are aggregated to generate a, um, a sample of the environmental data, or the, the, what we call a, a study replica. So for instance, uh, if you are trying to infer what, uh, what relevant uh, environmental cues as the species perceiving, you will not only think about only one square, but you will consider multiple squares to see to see to see what resource are they using as they move, right? So that you can see the focus as the total area where you aggregate those environmental predictors that relates to what the species perceive. And lastly, we have the stand that is the spatial area or the time period of the full region under study. So this refer to all the area where you sampled different, um, different environmental predictors and response variables. And it includes all the area of a study because the, this, this limit frames how much environmental uh, variability you are re uh, at, at the end taking in account. So this could be, for example, uh, a region, could be uh, an study area, could be a country, so at the it's, it's like the, the biggest area that where you where you have all the environmental data that you could have considered. All right. Oh, I forgot about that. Well, continue with that. Uh, the scale of effect has a certain nature that we have to take in account. So first, there is no any scale of effect uh, that is correct for all the ecological process. Like the scale of effect vary according to to the ecological process, which is kind of evident when we think about processes that are, that occurs across space and time in different scales. So there, are, you you cannot study all the ecological process using only one scale. But uh, when we think about the variation of scales of effect that a species can perceive, uh, we know that populations and communities. Uh, can be affected by multiple attributes of the species along their life cycle. For example, their, their, their foraging requirements, their breeding requirements, or how they are competing with other species. And that can also alter how a species perceive their environment. And at the end, this could be reflected on, on the scale. So for instance, if we have a bird, in, in this case, coming back to our the, the bird that we are interested in preserving, uh, we can think about how a species interact differently with their environment according to their needs. For instance, we can think about a bird, the bird that uh, when they're looking for their nesting resources, they might and they might change their, their behavior toward, uh, toward the environment in a sense like they will look for smaller areas where certain resources that would allow them to nest. But if the intention of the species is only to forage and just look for a, a, a food resource, maybe its behavior will change and will will motivate more uh, higher dispersal compared with behavior that favors breeding. So th this, has this has important implications for definition of the scale of effect, because at the end, a species can respond to environmental factors and multiple scales uh, within the same ecological process that we, we might be looking at. So, and also, uh, not only uh, the, the perception of a species is altered by factors that are intrinsic to the species, but as well there, there could be there could be uh, in, in extrinsic factors that could a a affect the how the species perceive the environment and, and in the end be scaled to where they do it. So for instance, we can think about uh, how a predator could affect this uh, a species uh, movement. So this in the end will have also implications on, on the scaled and, and in all, or the total area that the species could access to to their to environmental resource, or we can think also on the weather that we, it's also like a, a a phenomena that it's extrinsic to the species, but can also affect how it interacts with its environment, uh, with its proximate environment. So this variation in how a species perceive an environment led to something called the multi-scale paradigm. paradigm in which we embrace the notion that uh, ecological processes can occur in multiple domains and in multiple scales and, 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 
at unique range according to its, each species' unique perception, perception of the environment. So uh, this, this led us to, this scale, uh, this, this paradigm, sorry, has led us to um, consider the idea that researchers should characterize species habitat interactions at multiple scales and try to identify which scales are relevant for the interaction that they are, that they are, uh, that they are evaluating. All right, and well, uh, following with the previous uh, graph that I showed you how we characterize the scale, uh, we can define questions around the scale according to how we define the different uh, attributes of the scale. So for instance, um, if you think about the, the grain of, of the scale you can, uh, that you have access, you can you can question if the grain that you are using as a as a your environmental a fa with your environmental factor is detailed enough to to the the, the 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 interaction of the species with that environmental factor, or you can also ask the the, the opposite question. Maybe the the, the the data that you have is is too fine that the, you are not you are not seeing the real the real perception of the species that could be a little bit more broad compared to what you, but with the characteristics of your data. On, on the other side, when you think about uh, how, how the species might um, perceive long areas of, or large areas of environmental attributes, you can think about um, the total extent of areas that a species might interact with. Like it's a species interacted with uh, resources that are uh, 10, 10 meters uh, that are, are 10 meters from, from the species or one kilometer of distance from the species. What is the distance that a species can exactly perceive uh, the environmental resources uh, uh, around them? And also you can, uh, you can uh, make analysis in respect of how the extent of, the, of that you have examined could influence the, res the responses and the, the habitat interactions that a species have with their environment. So for instance, if you do, if inside your study area, you, you only have representation of very degraded habitats, the kind of interaction that you will observe in, in other studies areas where there is less degradation will vary uh, given, the, given the, the variation that it's within the, the total extent. So there is multiple ways to uh, assess the how is the scale impacts uh, our understanding of species habitat interactions, but uh, th there is a there is also like a, a focus on how the on how the <laughs> a, 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 well the attention has been concent concentrated on how the focus affects uh, our interpretation of the of, in, of habitat interactions. Because uh, usually the grain and the stand are not on, not are always under, not, are not always under our control. So, for instance, if you have, when you are acquiring data, um, you have to consider the trade-off or about about detail and amount of area that you will study, because it will imply that you will have to um, increase the the amount of uh, work and possible budget that you will need to sample there large area areas in, in 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 significant detail so usually these these issues are on, are 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 only deal with theoretically when you are trying to look for what is the best uh, conditions that are, or something um, strategies that that our researchers can can use to sample environmental predictors and that could be relevant for an for a species but uh, most of the research in the in the scale in the scale uh, paradigm are are concentrated in how the focus affect our interpretation of the of species habitat interactions. So well, so how do the scale problem emerge? So now we have we have talked about what is the scale, and we know that scales in ecological processes uh, are are variable, can vary according to the process that we are considering. And as well as how on, on how the species is interacting with the environment in different moments of its life, uh, according to and according to their needs. So the scale problem emerged when we compare two key two key aspects on the determination of scales of effect. 
So we ha we think we know that when we are studying an habitat and an, an ecological processes like habitat interactions, there there we think about a potential scale that exists and that it's what defines the interaction of the species with their environment, but we don't know what it is. So therefore, we kind of uh, set scales in our, in our study that we think might be associated with the, the with the ecological scale. However, it is quite it's quite possible that the scale where where the interaction of the species with its uh, relevant relevant environmental factors and the scale that we are studying does not align. So those differences could change um, our interpretation of the species in relationship with their with their habitats, and therefore could be problematic because we could we could end up having a different responses for the same resource in the in in the in the same conditions, and will that will stop us to to find like uh, concrete and verifiable uh, relationships that we can use as information to design a management plan for a species. So well, so how does this problem these problems can emerge? So we have uh, we we can have a, a mismatch uh, in the scales that we are studying uh, when we sample the data. So for instance, if as as we as I mentioned before, the the detail of the of the grain and the and the extent of the area will determine the environmental uh, variation that you can observe of the parameter that you're interested in. So therefore, it is possible that those changes, um, though, how you set the grain and the extent of your of your study area, will not represent what really the species is is inter interacting with, and therefore your conclusions could be biased. And as well, how do you aggregate the data of environmental variables to represent what the species overall interact with when they select their habitat could affect uh, the, the interaction that you see of that species or of, of a species with, their, with, the, with the resources that we think are relevant. Okay, so we can summarize this problem in something called the scale misalignment. So the scale misalignment refers to that discordance between the ecological scale and the scales of, of a study. And this, 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 this emerged in two, in two different cases. Uh, we can talk about spatial misalignment when our, we are the cause of the, of the misalignment because we are able to uh, arbitrarily change the area or the grain of the, of the, of the environmental var variable that we are looking at. And we have to make choices on what is the proper area or, or a scale that represent the environmental variation that the species can perceive. And also that, and that, that those differences can also let us to ambiguous determination on the scale of effect. Like if we are not evaluating enough scales, uh, we, we, might not, we might be seeing uh, different responses because the scales that uh, another researcher is looking at those are, do, do not agree with the, with the scales that I'm looking at. Uh, and from there, um, that could also that could also affect uh, how we perceive interactions of different processes uh, in between scales. So the, it is possible that processes uh, occurring at different scales depend one one another. But if we are not able to identify the correct scale where a process is occurring, we are we will need, we won't be able to see if it, it is, if this process is depending or is influencing influenced uh, by other processes at other scales. So well, so now from all from the scale problem and and all this debate that uh, it's happening around how we are sampling environmental data and species data and how that impact our inference inferences in habitat relationships, I I, I did my my master research, uh, so I will I, I will talk about a little bit about my, my research, and I will I will and I will show you this as an example of how uh, we can uh, assess the scale, and and try to identify what what is the better scale of effect for different ecological processes. So in my research, I I was interested I I am in, I was interested in the in in the human wildlife coexistence. 
So I I was I was uh, a cut by by the debates around the responses of a species to fragmentation. Um, this debate uh, originate, originated because uh, some authors were reporting negative effects toward fragmentation when they would look at the patch scale, but other authors were looking at, were reporting positive effects at the at the landscape scale. So this had very important implications for the for the design of protected areas and how we are because uh, delimiting areas for species preservation, because negative effects of fragmentation will imply that we will need to, to conserve areas, continuous areas of the same habitat for a species, while positive effects, effects of fragmentation will lead to, to think that it is not necessary to have big areas for of the of same habitat for a species to persist, but that maybe there are possible different arrangements that a species can use uh, that doesn't depend on the size of the of the habitat. Uh, so this this debate it's it's it, it, it was it it is highly dependent on the scale. So how what what are the what are the lens that you use to define the problem? So when I when I wrote about it, I I, I questioned myself if if we were defining habitats from a species perspective, because when we define a patch or a landscape, we're using um, usually a, a, a dichotomic classification is is used. Like we have the habitat that could be, for example, for a forest bird, a forest, and the rest of the land covers in a map could be uh, are, are considered the matrix or juice covers that are not relevant for the species. So this arbitrary definition of habitat. Uh, might might be problematic when we are uh, characterizing a species relationship with their habitats, and therefore, um, what that I decided to do uh, to do my research about uh, how a species of birds uh, interact with land covers at different scales. So I before I, I think I I thought about this as a as a as a previous step of considering how the species sees see their, see their habitat. So instead of uh, arbitrarily thinking that the species are seeing the habitat in patches, I, I decided to go, to go a step back and think about how what what how a species are, are interacting with not, not the, the structure, but only the amount of different land covers. So I use birds in my research because uh, birds can respond can respond to landscape changes occurring at large distances compared to other organisms because they can fly. And also uh, they have particular behaviors that allow them to be um, of easy study compared to other organisms. And also I focus on habitat amount because uh, this variable has a very strong influence on other landscape metrics like the patch size or the connectivity. It, it, the, the habitat amount in, in, the, in the debate of the landscape fragmentation was kind of a variable that need to be controlled before we can examine other other processes and and dynamics in landscapes. So I this I, I choose a group of birds uh, called the Farland birds. It, this is an artificial uh, classification that um, a researcher in 2020 did uh, from some birds in Ontario. Uh, this group of birds are birds that can actively use uh, agricultural areas. And uh, they were proposed as a possible uh, indicator of, of habitat. Of um, it was it was it was it was created as a possible indicator for the quality of uh, agricultural areas in environmental terms. So to to I wanted from with these birds, I wanted to understand the interaction of 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 them with all the land covers around them. And the process that allowed me to kind of uh, link the species with uh, the land covers uh, was habitat selection. So habitat selection is uh, a species active choice of locations to balance favorable and unfavorable conditions. It's a process in which uh, the species, or we, we assume that the species, uh, Bef when they reach a location, we ha they have to make a choice if they if they see favorable or, or, or favorable conditions. So we can assume that location with with high quality habitats will be disproportionately selected for low quality for low quality ones. So 
we can use uh, data like a species occurrence. And from, with the front occurrence, we can assume that those, those areas that the species are, 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 are being seen are actually being selected compared to other areas where the species are not being seen. So the process of habitat selection uh, also occurs at cross multiple scales. So Johnson in 1980 uh, proposed a framework to, to kind of differentiate uh, different uh, scales at which this well, conceptual scales in which this, this, the, the process of habitat selection occur. So he defined uh, five different levels of selection. So if you can see in the graph, uh, this, this, these different levels uh, are spatial, spatially delimited. And we can think about processes that occur from a geographical scale to processes occurring only at um, microhabitat scale and very small scales. So for my research, I decided to focus on habitat uh, home range selection. Uh, and I did this because uh, birds uh, have a particular behaviors that uh, during certain uh, times, specifically during their, bre their breeding time, uh, they, they, they limit their movements towards certain areas. And these areas can be, can be measured. And that's what we call home ranges. All right, so I wanted to, an to, to answer two questions with my research. The first one was if farland birds in Southern Ontario uh, selected land covers proportion uh, as an habitat cue, and if they did, uh, what, there's, that, what they were selecting or avoiding and at what scales. And also from there, uh, I, will, I, 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 also inter I was also interested in seeing if uh, the selection of of, of farland birds for those land covers uh, differ differ between the species with a different degree of specialization. So in in Kirk in Kirk 2020 classification of farland birds, he identified two six different groups of birds with different degree of specialization and different land covers. So I I use I use that classification to see if the degree of specialization of these birds will also influence in how they perceive environmental resources in terms of a scale. So for I, uh, the data that I use to do this research uh, have uh, species data that I, I obtained from the breeding bird surveys, which are standardized road, road surveys. I, I use data between 2013 and 2019 and I, I build a occurrence data set, uh, a data set that only have one and zeros. And I only uh, work with a species that have a that had a detection higher than five percent. Uh, for the environmental information, I use uh, the agricultural crop inventory, which is which, which is uh, land cover data that uh, had information about uh, different land covers. Uh, I, uh, this in, this include tree land covers, shrubs, and all these land covers over here. And what I did uh, to measure uh, the, the, my environmental predictor of interest, uh, I measured the land cover amount of these land covers at multiple scales, uh, having como, having as focal area the the point the point of observation of of the species along the roads uh, of the breeding bird surveys. So uh, for each point with, where the species was or, or not observed, I measure all these land covers at multiple scales uh, that are, could be relevant for this for the species. Uh, these scales, I, I, I base these scales on, on information about their uh, home ranges. So for instance, some of these species have uh, home ranges that are as big as 50 hectares or smaller. And from there, I added Big, uh, bigger scales uh, to see if these this species were interacting with resources out of their home ranges as well. Then with the, with the information of the species and the, environment, and the environmental data of the land covers, I build a resource selection functions. A resource selection function is an aesthetic, a statistical model that uh, represents uh, the probability of a species using a resource in a, in a specific location. So I did, I use generalized linear models with a logistic link uh, to, to 
to be able to uh, classify the, uh, the, the use of the units uh, of, the, of the locations that I studied. So all, all of this formula uh, represent that I, I use a, a logic probability that goes between one and zero that are, that are the my response variable zero and one occur it, it the very occur in the location or, or, or it didn't and um, I I I I adapted a linear model to a logistical regression to be able to uh, assess diff, uh, in a, in, a, in in an additive way the different environmental predictors that I was interested in. So I build multiple models uh, for all the species using a multi-model inference approach. So in this approach, I, I build, first I build univariate models for each land cover uh, for, for each species. So for instance, for example, I will, I will try to predict the, the occurrence of the species based on only one land cover, for example, forest. And I will do one model for each scale for each land cover. And from those models, I selected those land, uh, those land covers and scales that had the higher uh, inference power. So for instance, uh, for, uh, if, if, I, if, if I was looking at all the scales at forest, I will select only the scale that, have the, that had the higher explanatory power. And from there, I use all the land covers and scales combinations with the highest planetary power and build multivariate models uh, to identify what was the best model that included multiple scales of multiple land covers. All right. So what what did I, what were my results uh, from this modeling process? So first. Uh, 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 in this graph, I'm showing you uh, the number of, of species that selected uh, a certain land cover at a, at an, at a, at a certain scale. So in the X axis, you will see the scales, and in the Y axis, you will see the land covers. And uh, the colors are showing the number of, of species they, that in their model, they, inc they include the, that the covariable uh, between land cover and scales. So as you can see, uh, there was there was an, uh, there was a lot of variation in the selection of scales, and there was there was a, a strong selection between scales that were considered like a smaller, like the smaller scale, and the large scale. Also, when I when I compared uh, how a species selected scales between generalists and specialists, I I could observe that uh, specialists tended to select. A smaller scales in certain cases compared to generalists, while generalists were selecting larger scales, um, and this could this could this, ha this had this has important implications of how we understand how species or generalists are selecting their environment. I also explore how each of the land covers uh, change their relationship with the species. Um, uh, in this graph, you can see. Uh, um, you can see a representation of the of the scales and uh, the the the, um, the relationship of the of the of the land cover with that scale. So, for instance, uh, you can see in crops uh, that the the interaction uh, with the species uh, was mostly constant ac across the scales, like. Uh, the 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 y eds are the bit, the beta co coefficients of the models, and these that if they are positive or negative, they indicate if the interaction with the land cover was uh, favorable or unfavorable, if the species was selecting or avoiding the land cover. So uh, I, I I saw multiple uh, behaviors on, in terms of how uh, uh, species perceive the uh, specific land cover at different scales. So in crops, I, I saw that there was no variation of how the species perceived the, the land cover. And this might be explained because of the area that I studied, like Ontario is a very, it's a highly uh, agriculture, it's, a, it's, a area with, it's an area with multiple agricultural areas and very few um, natural areas. It's very developed. So the, the, the crop land cover is, co is al almost constant, although, Across the, across the landscape. So it doesn't matter what scale we use, you, we will see that 
the most dominant uh, cover is crops. So that might, that might explain why uh, crop as a land cover didn't, uh, didn't affect the species differently across the scales. But for instance, other land covers uh, show that uh, they could, they, they, their interaction or the, that's the strength of their interaction with the species uh, decrease with the scale. So for instance, developed covers and grassland covers, as uh, when, the, when the scale increase, uh, the, 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 inter, the strength of interaction of that land cover with the species uh, was, was lower. So this could imply that uh, for these species, um, the, the impact of these land covers, it's more, it's stronger at, at the smaller scales. And what they get, uh, while the distance from this species from this land cover increases, the effect of the land cover decreases as well. And also, I, I, could, I could observe cases in which the interaction with the land cover uh, swift of, from, from, the, from, the, from a negative interaction to a positive interaction. So this was the case for the, the tree land covers, the shrubs, and the wetland land covers. And in this case, uh, these changes, uh, uh, I could associate them with um, the, 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 the preferences of the species. So for instance, uh, if you can see, uh, the, these triangles corresponds to uh, a group that I call, that were called pasture specialists, a species that prefer grasslands. And so as you can see, like grassland specialists, uh, as they tend to avoid trees at smaller scales, but when the scale, the scale increases, the, the direction of the, the, the interaction seems to change. So it seems like despite that they are avoiding trees at smaller scales, they might be uh, uh, selecting uh, trees at large, uh, or, well, the amount of trees at larger scales. And this also uh, have different implications uh, for, uh, for our understanding of how species interact with their, with their environment that I will explore in the next slide. So this is an example of the of the um, of the complete model and the different the, the of the of two species, the bobolink and the Easter meadowlark, that they were part of the pasture specialist group. And in this graph, uh, I use uh, my this is these are margin, marginal predictions of the land cover influence uh, on on these birds. So this means what this means is that I model the interaction of the species with each land cover, but keeping all other land covers uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a constant value, like in a mean value. So I only I, I only saw changes of the of the interaction of the species for each land cover. And and this this graph uh, includes all the scales of which each species interacted with their environment. And as you can see, like for uh, these species have interaction with multiple scales. So they were not only selecting one scale, but they were interacting with their environment at multiple scales. So for instance, for uh, the bubble link, uh, it selected grasslands at, at, a, at a radius of, of 400 meters, but uh, it also avoided uh, shrubs develop and wetland at, at the smaller scales. Uh, the bubble link and the ester meadowlark. It also selected uh, grasslands at the same scale, but it selected shrubs at larger scales. So this this could be associated with uh, a particular behavior that, that these species have. That is, uh, that uh, when they use grasslands, uh, these the grasslands are usually their breeding their breeding uh, their pref their preferred breeding land cover. Uh, and the and the, the selection for small scales will rep will represent that that preference for uh, grasslands with a with a certain minimum size. In this case, for uh, landscapes that have at least a, a radius of 400 meters. But a selection to shrubs at larger scales could be associated with the their their preferences for some open and uh, areas with shrubs and trees where they can perch and they can. Uh, explore the territory and establish their territory. So as, as you can see, it is possible to associate differences on the scale in, at which uh, a species interact with uh, environmental variable, in this case, land cover, and see links between their behavior 
and how are they perceived? So, well, uh, from my research, uh, it, it, it has uh, different implications and uh, I will explore some of these implications through the, these three questions. So first, uh, what, did, what did habitat selection at varying scales indicated? But well, first it indicated that farland birds in Ontario selected land cover proportions and scales between it, below 800 meters and above uh, 1600 meters of variety. So which get in line with the, with the idea that the species uh, at the landscape level, um, they interact with local and larger uh, environmental factors. So this could be associated with the patch scale and the landscape scale. I also, I, I, I also saw that uh, multiple scale response, responses in a, and scale dependency uh, could be in, involved with distant ecological, distant epo ecological processes potentially involved, which was the case, for example, for the bubbling that it shows uh, for the for the eastern meadowlark that it shows like uh, a change in, the, in its interaction with the tree land cover according to the scale that could be associated with a with a particular behavior that the species have uh, in terms of their needs of breeding versus uh, territorial explore, exploration and dispersal. And also, uh, it's, it, 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 I, I observed that farmer specialists might be selecting land covers at smaller scales than generalists, which went, a li which went against the, the idea that specialists will, will tend to select lar larger areas because as, as, uh, the, as the, well, the idea behind the, this, this hypothesis of especially selecting larger areas than a generalist is based on, on the idea that uh, as especially select the resource that is that is scarce in the in the in the in the overall habitat or in the overall study area, they will try to explore lar lar they will have to explore lar larger areas to find the resources that they need. But in this case, uh, what I found was that they selected the smaller scales. So this this made me understand that uh, in their, uh, interpreting. Uh, the, the the size of a scale selection with the uh, and its relation with ecological process is not a straightforward. So it's very species specific and context specific, and you have you you will have to uh, uh, look at the potential mechanisms that will are generating these 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 differences in a scale. So what were the implications of my sample scales? As I mentioned before, like the sampling scale I can could limit uh, the, the 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 power of the inferences on my study. So uh, I, I I acknowledge that the processes occurring at the smaller scales uh, were not accounted in my study. So for example, those processes occurring uh, um, at at micro scales or within patches, I didn't I didn't consider these processes. But uh, this this was this was not a problem because uh, within the habitat selection framework. Uh, I was modeling the selection of the species for that location, but not the the end result of that selection. That 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 would mean if the species you use that area, and was able to have a positive uh, fitness outcome. So this is just uh, this means that my research is just an approximation of one of the uh, of the decisions that the, the species have to make al along along the, pro the its process of habitat interaction. Also, uh, I worked with the finest grain possible. I didn't, I didn't aggregate the pixels of the land covers, so this guaranteed that I, I didn't lose environmental information due it due to summarization. But also, it it could imply that, uh, well, it implies that I didn't explore changes on the grain as possible uh, variables that can also alter my understanding of species interaction with their environment, which is it was out of the scope, but it's important to take in account. Uh, also, uh, um, uh, an important an important uh, um, bias on my research uh, is is linked with the data, uh, the species data, in which uh, all the all the current information was based on road surveys. So I was I wasn't uh, sampling uh, all the habitat in a in a random way, but only those that were beside roads, which might have implications of of on the interaction that I of the species that I was looking at. Uh, for example, uh, 
some species will, will exhibit different behaviors when they are at the edge of their habitats. So most of the data that I have was from those edges. And I also, uh, it's important also to understand that um, in my research, uh, it's just as like a, a snapshot of the of the of the all of the ecological process that we're looking at. I only looking at the at a particular moment on on the species uh, uh, process of interaction with their habitat, and that there might be other processes along uh, along all the their their process of selection that might in, influence um, what I see. All right, and what were the implications of my analysis scales? Well, uh, the scales that I studied, uh, again, uh, aligned with the idea that uh, both local and large-scale scales are important. And that is likely that uh, both uh, migration and dispersal processes and breeding behavior processes are shaping the scale interaction of the species with their habitat. But uh, again, it's very hard to interpret uh, what finer scale selection mean against core selection. Because even generalists that we think that they select, uh, they could select habitats uh, in in large areas, they also attributed selection for finer scales, which means that uh, we cannot interpret selection for a certain scale as a as a as a as a as a immediate requirement. Well, and in in respect okay, to okay, Juan, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. We are at time, my friend. All right. I will uh, I express my appreciation. I think we've got the, very much the gist of your particular work there. Um, in the interest of time, though, I will make sure that people have a bit of a chance to ask any questions that they might have. Uh, and certainly, if it gets posted up on YouTube, people can certainly contact us directly, and we can sort of pass along. For the audience, um, if there's anything you'd like to ask Juan in a minute or two, we have a bit of time. Um, Beyond that, of course, I will uh, make sure we wrap up sort of here. We started a few minutes late with one, but uh, uh, if there's anybody, any questions, go right ahead. I'll give it I going. Have a quick one. question. Oh, go ahead, Anne, you're ready. Yep. Based on the findings of your research, if you had to uh, provide advice on how to revamp, rework our current uh, system for uh, designing protected areas, which is heavily based on representation um, and factoring in connectivity. What what are the key pieces of advice mm -hmm. based on your research that you would provide to a government agency or any conservation agency? Um, as they want to move forward with selection of protected areas. So, well, the the contribution of the analysis of a scale for the uh, definition of protected areas, uh, it's related to how we define we define uh, relevant limits in terms of area uh, for a species uh, to interact with their environment, right? So when we are defining protected areas, we have to take into account that a species might be interacting with their environment at the scales that are larger than the areas that we might be interested in preserving. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we may have to take into account not only uh, measurements of, for, for example, the size of the, of the protected area, but as well, all their surroundings. So it's, its implications are more uh, are more important when you are considering external factors to the protected areas, and also considering mm -hmm. how a species might interact differently with the protected areas. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, and then we'll have to conclude if anybody has any. I'll auction it off going once and then twice and then three times. 
All right. Thank you to Juan as our speaker, and thank you to our audience again for this time of the year. We usually get uh, a lot more uh, interested in having a sort of people view it remotely. We'll have having another webinar as soon as I can get the speaker to be scheduled with it, so I'll have that advertised in the usual fashion. Once again, thanks to Juan, and thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, with that, I will conclude our meeting and halt recording. It will be up on YouTube probably within 24 hours. YouTube is actually screening everything for AI these days. Juan, you have no worries. Um, but uh, well, it takes a little bit longer now to get the things up than it used to. As a result, they're still working at the bugs. So thank you all. Thank you once again, Juan. No, thank, thanks to all of you for he for hearing my presentation. I hope that you have uh, learned a little bit more of the about the scale problem and how we are implemented it now in understanding the habitat interaction of the species. And it has mm -hmm. multiple applications that are still need to be explored. <laughs> Indeed, thank you very much. Actually, I'm going to hit the recording button and we'll end the meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Have a good day.